nice nice where in india were you okay so we are from north east uh, we are from new delhi uh, both my husband and myself yeah so um that's great anybody else wants to add go ahead awesome Oh, so I think you talked about it last time. Yes, yes, perfect, perfect, beautiful. So we're gonna have a little bit discussion. I know last time we we were, um, it was more of let's talk about it. We didn't have a PowerPoint. We just wanted to discuss it openly, what Sikh faith is all about. Now the word Sikhism is not a correct word, but people use it and we don't really mind because Sikhism, like Hinduism, Buddhism, is a word that came from colonization. The word is Hindu, which is for Hindu religion. The word is Sikhi for Sikh religion. The word is Bodh for Buddhism. So the colonization made all of them isms. It's really not an ism. But so we're gonna talk about who are Sikhs. Anybody else want, uh, knows anything about six in general like what does the faith involve or you know which part of india are they from or things like that they are called the warrior because it's a perfect perfect question actually um so sick faith was developed mostly to help others to fight for others so we the, the way the religion kind of formed it was never really a religion because even our holy book has sayings from different religions in it from different religious saints and prophets in it so our holy book is like a compilation of three four five different faiths that are prevalent in the indian subcontinent and around and has the sayings from it so the when the religion was kind of formed or the way of life was characterized as sikhi it was formed to protect people from uh, getting, I, I want to in easy terms use the word bullying, but it was more so forceful conversion. There was a lot of forceful conversion happening at that time. And that time was a time of um, crusades. And that was a time from, uh, from Middle East, there was crusades in India, from England, there were crusades in India. So there was a lot of push of conversion from Hindu faith or any faith that people were following at that time, because both faith, uh, Buddhism also came before Sikhi. So any faith that people were following, at that time, there was a lot of forceful conversion, people either convert or they die. So that was basically the, the solution. So Sikh, Sikh faith basically started to protect people and to stand up for the rights of others to say that we should have the right to believe in what we want to believe in. And we should not be forced to convert. People can convert if they want to convert, that's totally up to them, but there shouldn't be a forceful conversion. So that time, the warriors started protecting people. You know, uh, young females used to get kidnapped and taken to the different kings or different people who were doing the conversion. Uh, they were being raped. So Sikh faith basically at every night, midnight, 12 o'clock, that is a time that all the Sikh warriors will raise up and go to get those women back. So they started uh, creating armies to fight. So from our um, sixth guru onwards we have 10 gurus 10 teachers and our and i would say 11 because our present teacher is our holy book so from after the sixth teacher after the four, fifth teacher there was an army that was kept by each teacher by each guru to kind of start start to train people for those battles and the, most of the battles happened between the eighth teacher and the tenth teacher uh, and we talked a little bit more about it, I think, last time in the group type discussion. So today I want to keep it a little bit more general, but that was a great question. I hope I answered it. Okay, so we'll do question answer in a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit more about who are six. So can you go to the next one, please? Thank you. So I would uh, pop quiz. I, nobody tell you, told you that you have to come prepared for a quiz, but here it is. So we want to talk about, is Sikhism a sector of Islam? So you have to tell me A, B, or C. So, or Sikhism a sector of Hinduism? Sikhism is a blend of Hinduism, Hinduism and Islam. Sikhism is an independent religion. So people for A, 
Can you raise your hand, please? People for B. Anybody for B? B. People for C. Anybody for C? No, very good. People for D. Whoa, you are the most educated group I've ever seen. <laughs> so that is correct. D is a correct answer. Even though uh, our gurus initially were born into Hindu families because, I mean, Christ was born into a Jew family, right? So even our teachers were born into a Hindu family. Sikhism became an independent religion. So it is an independent religion. It is followed as an independent religion. Like any religion, you do adapt things from religions around you. So we were in Indian subcontinent and from Indian subcontinent, we have adapted things from Hinduism and from Islam, but there's a lot of dis big distinct differences between Sikhism and Islam and Sikhism and Hinduism. And we can talk more about it if you have questions on that. So next one. Um, so can you guess how many, uh, uh, you know, Sikhism, oh, well, the question is already answered, I guess, in the bottom. So Sikhism is the fifth largest religion. A lot of people don't know that because most of the people have not heard Sikhism. And when people see a Sikh, they automatically assume that this person probably belonged to a sector of Islam, mostly because of head covering. But Sikhism is the fifth largest religion. And it, it, it is not known to be, but it is. Mostly because six are very scattered. And I think I used that analogy last time. If you can find potatoes, you can find six because they're everywhere, every part of the world. I, we have gone to Iceland and found six. So we, you know, six are everywhere. And everywhere they are, they have a Gurudwara, that is their temple, the door to the Guru, the door to the teacher. Their temple is everywhere they go. So, because it's spirituality is a huge part of Sikhism. So next one, please. Can everybody hear me okay? I do. I need the mic, okay. Uh, so a little bit of history. So Sikhism, as I've been talking about Indian subcontinent, uh, part of Indian subcontinent is obviously India, Pakistan, Nepal, uh, Sri Lanka. What else would you say? Bangladesh. Uh, she, she's more knowledgeable in geography than I am, so I have to ask her. Uh, I also want to use the correct terminology for the subcontinent, too, because I think the terminology is changing a little bit. Uh, I used to sign forms about where I, I am from, and it used to be Asia, and now it is Asia-Indian subcontinent. So I, on the forms, I have to check that box. So people are getting that knowledge because when you think about Asia, you only think about Asian countries as China, Japan, Korea, those countries, you don't think about India and Asia, but India is in Asia. Anyways, so we are from Southern Asia and uh, Punjab region, which is the Northeast, Northwest part of actually uh, India, because East is on this side and North is the top of India. And, um, Pa part of North, uh, West part of India and part of Punjab, so uh, Pakistan, because Punjab before 1947 was India and Pakistan was one country, right? So after Britishers left or the year Britishers left, they divided the country into multiple parts. And the biggest part was the division of India and Pakistan. When India and Pakistan was divided, a big part of Punjab where Sikhs are from went into Pakistan, but all of the people who were not of Islamic faith, I shouldn't say all, but most of the people who were not of Islamic faith came to India because Pakistan became an Islamic country and India became a Hindu country. Since a lot of, some of the followings of Sikhism were kind of related to Hinduism, I think everybody from Sikh faith came into uh, India. Also under Indian law, Sikhs were still Hindus. So we, we did not get our rights as an independent religion in India for the longest time. Now it is it is there. So we, we had to follow where we had rights. So all the six came here. So there was a lot of disturbing time. My family, uh, my parents family is from Pakistan. My husband's parents family is from Pakistan. And so a lot of our cultural 
things are actually in Pakistan. A lot of our religious places, holy places are in Pakistan, which we do get to see. And people in Pakistan love Sikhs, by the way, because, and people in India love Sikhs too, because we feed everybody. If you have ever been to a Sikh temple, there is food 24 seven, free food, vegetarian, all the time, all cooked by volunteers. Uh, Amritsar, which is uh, Harmandir Sahib Golden Temple, feeds at least at the very minimum 100,000 meals, a meal, 100,000 people per meal a day. So if they are feeding, let's say um, four meals a day, so each meal is over 100,000 people, free, no cost, all run by volunteers, no employees there to cook, clean, do dishes. They don't use disposables, by the way, they use steel plates and they wash them. Sustainability is huge in Sikhism. So I talk a lot, I go on tangents, so I'm sorry about that. So, so we are from uh, Punjab, which is the um, South East Asia, South Asia. And there has been a lot of migration from Punjab to US and Canada. Um, there was a joke just I recently heard. It's like, what is Punjab? Punjab is a place which supplies people to Canada because most of the Sikhs are in Canada. So we have a lot of Sikhs in Canada, in America and in England. That's, I would say the majority of it. Anywhere else you can think majority of Sikhs? In US, the big concentration would be California and then uh, New York City, New Jersey has a lot of Sikhs too. Next one, please. So there has been a lot of Sikh pioneers in US history, and I, I don't wanna go too much in detail, farming, especially in, in military, in world wars. Uh, Sikhs have played a huge role in world wars, in politics, and California, majority of the farming is done by Sikhs. Sikh faith had a, has a lot to do with farming. Our first guru was a farmer. So he believed that farming kind of connects you to the soil, connects you to Mother Earth. So we have really a lot of love for farming. My husband loves it. I don't have a green thumb. I, everything dies if I touch it, so I don't touch it. But there has been a lot of pioneers um, that the first photo on the far right is on the, about the first Sikh temple in California when it started. Can I go to the next one? So major values, I think that's really important because these are going to resonate with each one of you. Doesn't matter what faith you follow, these are going to resonate with you because it is really a modern religion. People don't think about Sikhism as a modern religion. First of all, we are only 550 years old. So we are the most, we are the newest babies here. So the religion is pretty young. Secondly, a lot of these core values are the values of spirituality that is in every single religion, okay? So first and foremost, one God. How many of you think Hinduism has many gods? A lot of people think Hinduism has many gods. Technically, they don't. Those are all forms of gods that they believe in, but God is still one. So which, which is, I learned the hard way because I didn't know that. So I had to do a little research on religions that have many gods. Most religions believe in one God, correct? Are we, are we correct there? That all of us have one God, one God to answer to, one God to pray to, one spiritual superpower, right? So we believe in that too. Second is equality. Equality is huge. 550 years ago, um, Guru Nanak, the first, the founder of Sikhism, the first guru, the first teacher, and that's an important name to remember, Guru Nanak. Guru means teacher, Nanak was his name, N-A-N-A-K, Nanak. So Guru Nanak uh, said that, Sokyo manda akiye jit janne rajan. Why can, how can we call a woman bad? From women, kings are born. From women, lords and gods are born. We can't say bad, anything bad to women. Women have a higher authority. Women have a higher rating, if you may call it, or, uh, you know, a tier in Sikhism. You will never see a woman kind of shushed away in Sikhism. I mean, culturally things happen. If you are uh, dominantly in, in a space or in an area, uh, geographically or culturally where things happen, that's totally different. But normally there's a lot of push for women education, for women's, women to take on professional career in Sikhism. It's very, very important in Sikhism. And then a few years later, our 
um, third guru, I think, Guru Amar Das Ji on widow marriages. Yeah. So uh, she has more current knowledge because she's learning now. I learned it many years ago. Uh, so a few years later, um, I think it, you can count it to be maybe 500 or 450 years or so ago from now, there was a push for widow marriages started by the Sikh Guru. At that time, widows used to have no life of their own in Western and Eastern countries. In Eastern countries, most of them used to kill themselves because they really didn't have any life after their husband died. In Western countries too, there was really no value. Once you're a widow, you had no rights, you didn't own property. At that time, Guru Amar Das Ji said, we have to get to widow remarriages. We have to get them settled. We have to give them occupation so they can sustain themselves. So that, that's how important equality is. And not only between genders. Equality is extremely important between caste, creed, religion, everything in India. We sit on the floor to eat um, uh, in the Gurdwara, the langar, the, the food that I was saying is served free in the Gurdwara, in the, in the Sikh temple. We all sit on the floor equally to eat. So that if there is some a prime minister sitting next to me, and I could be maybe a beggar from the street. He's sitting next to me because we are all equal. Doesn't matter what our social status is. Doesn't matter what our religion is. Doesn't matter what our caste is because in India, that time and even in some rural areas now, caste is very important. Hindus have a caste system. A Brahmin is a higher caste. So he would, so uh, a person who cleans the bathrooms or pick up garbage would not be allowed to touch a Brahmin. So at that time, I'm saying 500 years ago, we said, we're all equal. God created us equal. So there was equality. There was no equality anywhere in Western or Eastern country, countries back then, but it was in Sikhism and it has been till now. Anything else to add there? Oh yeah, perfect example. So I'm an architect. I should know that one because that's important, right? So. Um, very important things, Sikh temples, especially all of them created uh, in India, because here lack of space sometimes doesn't allow that, but most of the Sikh temples, I'm saying temples, but again, the word is Guru Dwara, door to the teacher, has four doors on all four sides, north, south, east, west, to allow people from all directions, all walks of life, and to have them welcome them come in. So that was very important principle of Sikh architecture. Sikh architecture, by the way, looks a lot like Islamic architecture, but there are some distinct differences like that. And also women are allowed to pray inside the Sikh temple. They're, you know, I know Islam doesn't have a lot of that. In, and my daughter sings and she uh, at the temple, she does her solo pretty much every Sunday at the temple. She sings there. She's been singing since she was four years old. And a lot of women do sing. They, uh, I was the president of our temple in Albany. So you can host like uh, positions. You can be um, a leader, or like a high head priest. We don't have a system, but like a almost like that position in the temple. Women can have that. Women can lead the temple. It's allowed because of equality. Live uh, and earn honestly. So one of the biggest pillars of Sikhism uh, that differentiates from uh, some other religions, uh, especially for example, and I'll, I'll give you examples later, uh, is about earning an honest living. So we can't earn our living through gambling, through begging, uh, through some of the other ways. We have to earn our living honestly. So cheating, begging, borrowing, those type of things. I mean, you can borrow money, but you have to be honest about it. So earn an honest living and then um, share that living. In every religion so far that I've learned, and I've taken a lot of world religions classes because I love to learn about religions because I feel it is so important to understand how we each one of us connect, right? To spirituality, to each other. So in, in Sikhism, it's very important to talk about this one, which is 10th of our earning goes to helping communities. And it could be in time and money. So we, we also spend a lot of time doing community service. So we will go, uh, we run blood drives. Uh, I'm talking in Albany, very small community, probably like 300 families maximum. I would say 200, 200 300 families, very small community. And we run um, 
you know, twice a year we run blood drives. Pretty much every month we run food drives, clothes drives. We just uh, have been collecting money for Afghan refugees that have come into our area. We have just recently collected money to send to Ukraine. Uh, and, you know, these are the things that continuously go on uh, as, as we work. And obviously the food, we have, we have to serve food, right? That's important. Uh, service to humanity, which is the piece that I was talking about, the word that we use for service to humanity is called seva. And that's a word that I think a lot of sub-Indian continent people use, the word seva, S-E-V-A, and that is basically to help others. And I think that's prevalent in every religion. That's what connects us, because the empathy part to be able to help others is very important in every religion. And then social justice. So you asked the question about warriors. Social justice is extremely important to us because we are warriors, right? So for us, that's a very important piece. So to talk about it, and I think our, our new generation here is more into social justice than we can ever be. And I'm proud to say that, that it actually resonates very well with Sikh values to talk about social justice. So Sikh Collision, that's how we got connected, right, Lucy? So Sikh Collision, when they are doing their, they're called Sikh Collation. And when they're doing all their work to fight for rights of uh, Sikhs, they're not doing only to fight for rights of Sikhs. They did talk about and did fight for rights for Jews, rights for LGBTQ, rights for Muslims, right for Hindus. They fight about everybody. They, they don't just keep it to one sector. They're fighting for the rights of minorities. And it could be any, in anything, for genders, for anything, right? So social justice is extremely important. Number seven. Next slide, please. So we have 10 gurus, like I said, and that part becomes a little bit confusing for people. Why 10 gurus? Why not just one? I think it was the time period that, and that's just my belief. The time period from when the when the Sikh faith was founded by Guru Nanak to when Guru Gobind Singh Ji actually established it as a religion, um, that there were ten gurus. So Guru Gobind Singh Ji is the tenth guru, Guru Gobind, and the first guru was Guru Nanak. And so there are ten gurus, and our present teacher is our holy book. We consider our holy book as a living teacher. Mostly because the sayings of these gurus are in it. The sayings of various saints and various prophets are in it. So when you bow to the living guru, to the teacher, when you go to the um, Gurudwara, the temple, the first thing you see, you don't see any idols. We don't believe in idol worship, so you won't see any idols. You won't see any photographs inside the main hall. There might be photographs in where you eat food and other lobby areas, but no photographs inside the main hall because we don't believe in idol worship. We believe in bowing to the teaching. So when we are bowing to our live guru, to the holy book, we are bowing to the teachings and asking blessing of that one God, right, the one God, to give us these teachings so we can absorb them, learn from them, and follow the path, right? So the teachings here are from different religions in it. So that's why it's considered to be a modern faith, because it doesn't talk about one religion. It talks about all of us spiritually being connected and our purpose in life. I think all of us spend so much time in life thinking, what's my purpose? Why was I born? What have I done? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to live very long. What do I have to do? We think about these things all the time. And it doesn't matter what age. We start thinking about this. I think the first discussion about purpose I had with my daughter, she was five years old. She asked me a question and I'm like, sick faith tells you what your purpose is. You have only one purpose. So this saying by the fifth guru says, you have been given this human life. We believe in reincarnation, by the way. So you have been given this human life and your sole purpose of this human life is to connect to that one spiritual power, to connect to God. Because as animals or as other, you know, insects or birds or whatever, you have the knowledge, but you don't have that extreme brain power to be able to meditate and connect. So you, as a human, you have been given, you have been lucky 
to receive this birth as a human life because in reincarnation you go to different versions of life you could be a snake animal whatever you want to be not you want to be whatever you are assigned to be i guess based on your doings in this lifetime um but you have been given this life so your sole purpose in life is to connect to god right so that's that's where the the teachings come from is don't no no point searching for purpose do good because how do you connect to god you do good you help others you meditate on god but you live a practical life and earn an honest living because you can't run away to jungles or top of a mountain and just meditate and leave your family and everybody behind that's not a practical way of life and sikhism doesn't believe in that way of life that's what differentiates us from some other religions um in in uh, you know indian subcontinent we don't believe in leaving the family and going separate ways to just meditate we believe that practically living in family is important but at the same time live a mindful life live a mindful existence so every day when you get up be thankful and start living a mindful day and make that a practice how you can if you're mindful you're going to automatically start doing good right you're going to help others you're going to th think about what you're doing because you'll be mindful so long tangent there but that's what this was uh next one uh identity so um a lot of people like like we talking about identity is extremely important and you see my husband here i don't know if we introduced him right amrit paul i'm sorry he's being the it guy helping me uh so a lot of times we we look at six wearing turbans and a lot of six women wear turban too you would have seen on the brochure if somebody received that uh, the flyers six women also wear turban i i'm not there on my journey to wear a turban but uh identity is extremely important it's very important for people to be able to identify a sick but why anybody know why it's important to identify a sick in a crowd any guesses exactly exactly if you can't identify a sick so if you can't identify a cop how are you going to go ask for help right that's our purpose our whole purpose as a sick is justice is to fight for others so if you can't identify a sick how are you going to ask for help for the longest time even now and i've heard this from a lot of my friends who come from like different parts of india and and indian subcontinent they say that if you see a sick person with turban and you know you're being followed by somebody or being bugged you think they're you know somebody is following you to rape or whatever because it's very common uh, you know uh, in in indian subcontinent to be safe at night and you see a sick you run to that person and say i need help and because that's your the person who's going to provide you justice unfortunately after 911 turban became a sign of terrorism and we we got really badly hit with it a lot of six were killed um there has my husband couldn't wear his turban for almost a year maybe more uh because he used to work in new york city he used to work in world trade center center he was late that morning thank god we were not married then but thank god um so it, it hit us very hard and it hit some families even worse for us it was okay he couldn't wear the turban which he takes so much pride in he couldn't wear it but at the same time people were killed people were brutally beaten up a lot of this happened and it's still happening just last week richmond hill in new york city somebody hit a old uh sick man turban sick man and uh, there has been pictures of him shown like he, he was brutally hit so identity is important to us even after this this is nothing you know we have gone through where sick there was um a bounty hunters used to have how do you call it like money for sick head prize on their head we have gone through that time period in india in indian subcontinent so for us it's no big deal we still wear the turban with pride because that's a duty that has been given to us by guru gobind our, our last guru told us this is your identity you have to wear it okay next one 
So more about Sikh identity, um, you know, making a commitment to joining the Khalsa community. Khalsa is, um, the easiest way to explain is baptism, but we don't really have baptism per se, but it is just almost like coming into, everybody's a Sikh because everybody's a learner, but coming into a Khalsa community, you have to make few promises. First, you don't cut your hair and you don't you have unshorn beards you keep your hair covered first second obviously earn an honest living no cheating all that but also uh, no adultery third we don't eat halal it's very important to us not any meat that has been cooked or has been uh, killed in a halal fashion which is slow butchering of the animal with prayers, we cannot eat it. Because if you're killing an animal to eat, you're killing the animal for your own satisfaction. It doesn't make God happy. And you have to kill them in a process where they feel the least amount of pain. So we are not allowed to eat halal. We can eat meat from any grocery store or any restaurant. Um, a lot of the restaurants don't have halal, but there are few specific restaurants that serve halal food and we can't eat that. Uh, meat, uh, vegetarian food is fine. So for me, it's fine. I'm vegan. I don't care. But these guys have to worry about it. We don't have any restrictions on what animal to eat or not eat. We can eat any animal. No, no issues there. Um, but coming back to, um, what was I talking about? I'm sorry, I lost my dream. Khalsa, the code of conduct. Um, so adultery, a halal, no halal food, uh, and then uh, identity with your turban, unshorn beard. Women also don't cut their hair. My daughter has never done it. I have never done it. I barely, I only have this much hair. I don't have that much hair. It doesn't grow after a while. Um, but, and then uh, no smoking and intoxication. So we are not allowed to do drugs or uh, smoke. So that's not allowed. Technically, we're not allowed to have alcohol, but a lot of people do consume alcohol. So it's kind of like, here or there, but definitely no smoking, no drugs. It's very, very important. So those are the some of the code of conduct. And we have to carry five symbols with us. I think there is a slide on that. Um, I, I was have been working every night for past three nights, so I haven't gotten a chance to go through that in detail. But um, we will talk about those five symbols. We talked about that before as well. Uh, and let's go to the next one. These are the five symbols. Also, uh, coming into the Khalsa community, you can do it at any time of your life. I did it, what's it, 10 years ago, maybe 11 years ago. My daughter has not done it. She can choose to do it or choose not to do it. It's totally up to her, right? So it, it could be any time. But you carry these articles of faith with you once you're a Khalsa. Uh, you carry, uh, you have uncut hair, obviously. You carry a uh, Iron bracelet, which you will see you see on every sick, this little round bracelet, steel, iron, um, which symbolizes your marriage to God and to be able to do good. So you wear it on your prominent hand so that every time you see it, you realize I can't do something bad because I'm married to God. I have a commitment, right? Um, and then comb, which is the one on the far right, top right. Uh, comb is obviously because you have long hair, you have to keep it groomed. So it's also a symbol of reminding you that you are from this faith and you have to maintain that. Uh, it's a small comb that you wear it within your hair or you can wear it somewhere else. And then uh, kachera, which is underpants. So, you know, many, many years ago, I would say again, 500 some years ago, there was no concept of underwear. I don't know if you know that. There was really no concept of it. At that time, Sikh Faith said, I, call it, we, I mean, we are pretty hygienic people too. So very important for us. So wear underwear. But this, the main reason of wearing underwear was it's a long shorts. It's not like a short underwear. It's like a big brief type of underwear. The main purpose for that was to be able to run to battle if you have to and not feel like I'm not wearing clothes. Right. So that was one of the big reasons, because at that time, that was the thing you had to go to battle like this to help somebody or to, you know, for whatever you're fighting for. So that was one of the reasons. And obviously, self-discipline, it teaches you self-discipline. So you don't have negative thoughts about somebody. So that's another uh, symbol for it. And then can you uh, from my purse, give me a microphone. 
And then the other piece is Kirpan. And we talked about it last time when we had our smaller group of people from you guys. It's in the side pocket. So my uh, strap for it broke, so I have it in my purse. So it's a very small sword. When I say sword, it seems like a huge thing. I, I wear a very small one. People, I think in New York state law, you're allowed to wear a blade that's two and a half inches. So the casing could be bigger. Uh, by New York state law, you're, we are allowed to wear it. That's the fight we have been fighting to be allowed to wear it because it's an article of faith. It doesn't do anything. It's just a symbol. I can't, I can't kill anybody with this. Uh, I can't even like hurt anybody. It doesn't, it's, it's not sharp. But it is to remind you of your vow to help others, to protect others. That's the reason for it. So because it's an article of faith, and once you're part of the Khalsa community, you have to have it, right? So that's one of them. Uh, so my husband and I both are Khalsa. So we were both, we have taken, it's called Amrit to be Khalsa. And we have, we have to carry these articles of faith. Questions on articles of faith? You would have seen sick people carrying swords. It's very common, especially in India. They wear it openly too. Even here, some places they do. Uh, but, you know, and it, it is a small one that you are allowed to wear it even in government buildings. A lot of times, uh, obviously, you can't wear it on international travels and things like that. But, you know, we wear like a little tiny piece in the necklace or in our garments or whatever, which is not sharp. It's most, again, like a symbol. So next one, please. So uh, this part, we are actually going to try to do it here if we have time. I know we don't have enough time today, but we'll try. We brought with us turbans. So if anybody in is interested, we'll try to tie it for you. Uh, he's wearing a turban. We don't have a lot of experience tying turban to others. So we'll see how it comes. But um, like I said, women can wear turban, men can wear turban. Uh, turban is an important piece of our identity. And we talked about why it's important. It's also to keep your hair covered because you have long hair and you want to keep it covered. Uh, every, because turban is not like a hat, you can't just put it on. You have to tie it piece by piece. So every piece that you wrap around is a commitment. So it has a sim, you know, symbolic reason there. So you can't just, if somebody says, you know what, at the airport security or whatever, uh, you have to remove your turban. We can't remove our turban like that. So we tell them, take us to a room and we will, excuse me, remove our turban there. So we have, because we have to remove it piece by piece. It, it goes roll down, right? And there are different forms of turban. People wear different styles of turban. It's very common. This one might be the most common one you will see on sick men. Not that he wears a common style. Sorry. Um, okay, so um, mandatory for religious obligation for sick men. Um, technically, I would say it would have been mandatory for women, but a lot of women have just been covering their hair and not wearing a turban for centuries. But you know, a lot of women wear it too. So it's very common, uh, especially if you go towards California, New Mexico, there is a lot of American sick population. Uh, we call them white six, not, not being racist towards anybody, but we call them white six. But they, they wear turban because they follow the faith much better than we can ever follow the faith. They follow it to the T. They wear, they do the prayers at the times they have to be done and everything. So you will see a lot of those uh, wear turban. Three years ago, there was a sick woman won a Grammy Awards, uh, and she, a white son is the name of the band. If you ever want to look at it, uh, she wears a turban. She wears a white turban, and so it's very important. So next one, please. So these are different styles. So um, this one is. So the one um, on the top uh, left. So this one is your, you know, your very common basic style. And this one too is very similar. Uh, then there's woman turban, this one and this one. Usually round turbans are worn by women. There is a little boy turbans. And that's usually for, uh, you know, middle school, up to middle school kids will wear that. And then later on, they'll start wearing the other one. Some, some kids wear it longer. And then there is the round ones for, you know, these two are more for, easier 
uh, easier to wear type of thing. So if you are on the weekends or some people wear it regularly, whatever works for them. Next one, please. Uh, we talked about Gurdwara already. So a lot of this we have already talked about, which is a place of worship. Everyone is welcome. There is prayers. There is service learning. There is um, uh, usually most of the Sikh temples here, Gurdwaras have um, uh, you know projection that shows what we are reading in English so that people can follow. Uh, and then in America, services are held over the weekend normally. Some temples do have it, especially in New Jersey, New York City, they have it during the day, every day. Uh, but here, like uh, upstate New York, you have a temple very close to you in Fishkill. And uh, there we have weekend service there. So in Albany too, it's weekend service was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I think Fishkill is also Saturday, Sunday or something like that. There's another one down in close to Middletown, Monroe. Uh, area Woodland, uh, what is that called? Wood, Woodbury Commons? Woodbury Commons is one there as well. Same thing, weekend service. Uh, but in like Canada, in New Jersey, in New York, and in India, it's 24 7. So it's, it's all, all open all the time. Next one, please. Langar, we kind of touched on that as well. Uh, I'm glad I'm, I've touched on all this so we don't lose any more time. But uh, free food, uh, vegetarian. Uh, and it is served at the, you know, pretty much all day long. Again, a lot of the smaller areas would have it only on the weekends. But if you go to a temple and there's somebody there, doesn't matter what time of the day you go to, you can still get like maybe a glass of milk, some cookies or something so that you can at least get some snack or whatever is available to eat and they'll cook for you if there is somebody there. So you're welcome to go and try anytime. Um, the food is really good though, I, I must say. Um, Prepared by volunteers, cleaned, everything is by volunteers, spirit of equality, everybody's sitting together, we kind of touched on that as well. Uh, it's very, very important. So if you can't sit on the floor, then what happens? I can't sit on the floor. I'm assuming some of you can't sit on the floor. So they have tables, they have long tables where you can stand or eat or you can sit or eat so that people are still sitting together, but it's more on a long table format. So we do have that. Next one, please. Uh, I think you missed one. Language. We speak a language called Punjabi, which is from Punjab region of India. We talked about Punjab. So that's the Northwestern area of India and Pakistan. Uh, and Punjabi is, um, says 80 million people speak Punjabi, including many Sikhs living in US. Uh, I used to teach Punjabi in the Sikh temple to kids. So a lot of them speak it, a lot of them know how to read and write it. And I think it's very important because once you lose your language, you lose your culture. It's very important to keep the language going. So you will see Punjabi as a language that we use. It's very similar to Hindi. Hindi is another, it's an Indian national language. It's very similar, but it's a totally different script. Next one, please. Challenges six faith face in America. And I think we talked about some of that based on hate crimes, uh, especially after 9-11, it became even worse. Uh, uh, harassment in school, because there is a, you know, a lot of harassment for, even for girls, because they have long hair, you know, they, even for girls, because they have, they're carrying long hair, a lot of the girls don't even, uh, you know, clean their face or their legs, they don't wax or anything, they don't shave. So there has been a lot of harassment because of that, because technically, you want to keep your body as pure as God gave you. You don't, you, you're, uh, path in life is to connect to God and not to be, you know, on sidetracked by this. So it's very important. So based on that, there has been a lot of harassment in schools for kids. Uh, you know, they, it's not just bullying, it has been attacks, there has been incidents of somebody has tried to cut other person's hair or, you know, take their turban off or stuff like that. So they, they, we do face a lot of that. And teachers in the school community doesn't know my daughter has faced harassment in uh, second grade, second grade, uh, so one of her friends, they were playing and one of her friends said, oh, well, we are playing Christian camp. So she's like, what does that mean? So she said, well, on, in some, during summer, we go to Christian camp. So that's what we are playing the game for. And she said, okay. So she said, but you don't believe in Jesus, so you can't play with us. So uh, her friend, who is a very strict uh, Christian, stood by her and said, you can't do that to her doesn't matter if she believes in Jesus or not. 
you can do that to her. She can still play with us. She's our friend. So I, I really appreciate her friend in second grade having that, that empathy and that love for each other to be able to say that. Um, but I'm also saddened by the thought that who teaches a kid to say something like that to other kids, right? And her answer was, I don't know what believing in Jesus means because she didn't know. What we have taught her is that we have to respect each and every religion because every religion is unique and every religion connects you to God. So we, we must believe in Sikhism, but we don't have to say that any religion is bad. Every religion is good and every person is following their path. So it's very important. So, and obviously our, our, our holy book says that too. And she's faced a couple of other incidences and she decided to wear turban to school for a week. So people would come and ask her about her faith. And there's an article in Sikh Collision's website actually about that. Uh, and that was her own decision. I asked her, how do you want to resolve these? And she said, you know what, I, I think I'm going to talk to people. I said, how are you going to talk to people? You're only in second grade. How are you going to do this? So she said, you know what, I can dress up like a Sikh and go and see if people will ask me, then I can tell them. I thought that was a brilliant idea. So she did that and that was awesome. Okay, uh, workplace discrimination, uh, all of us have faced it. Uh, can I share your story, if, is that okay? So I'm not gonna name where he works right now, uh, just because of the purpose of the story, but he was hired in a prestigious organization uh, at a very high position. He's in IT, so he was hired, hired as a director in IT. And the you know, the group of people who hired him were very skeptical about his looks and he, he being in that, that area. So the president told him after he worked there for a few months, the president told him, he hugged him and said, he said, I fought for you. When everybody said, oh, do we really want to hire somebody who looks like that? I don't know what message we are sending because people don't know who sex are, I guess. And the president said, he's a sick. You know how hardworking they are? And I think he'll be a right choice. He's, he's gonna be super honest. And he changed the organization around within a few months, going from doing everything on paper to now establishing apps and so that everybody can use everything easily and be able to convert things. He changed the organization from being in the last century to now. <laughs> so, so those are the type of things, you know, and he has faced that along the way throughout his career, especially because how he looks. I have faced it, but, you know, when you look at me, you can't tell I'm a sick. You just look at the color of my skin. But with him, you can tell he's a sick. So he has faced it more than we have. Next one, please. There has also been attacks on sick temples, uh, and there was one on um, uh, what is it? Oak Tree, Wisconsin. Oak Creek, Wisconsin, was, has been an attack, um, you know, just like any place of worship for minorities, there are usually things like that happen. The only sad part is it wasn't addressed very well. So when things like attacks on any other community happens, six stand with those communities. Recent enough, Black Lives Matter. We went to protests in our area. I know six went to protests in so many different areas for Black Lives Matter. So things like we felt like we didn't have enough support from the community around us in the areas we serve, we help, we run, you know, blood drives, food drives, you help people. We want to at least have people acknowledge that this happened to us. That was the only sad part, but you know, this happened at least created some awareness for us. Everyday six, uh, Varis Alawalia, which is the, sorry, I, it's my clicker. Uh, this one, he's an actor and a model. He has been in quite a few movies. If you see, you, you would have seen him. And he, he is in full, uh, we call it sarup. That means in full attire. So he has a beard, he has a turban. Uh, he, he's a great model. He's actually in the Gap ads. <coughs> There's a lot, been, a lot of artists. Uh, six in army. By the way, six were not allowed in army for the longest time because of, oh, you wear a turban. We don't know how the masks will wear work or helmet will work or this will work. And you're like, well, we, we started the military culture. What are you talking about? 
Britishers had a separate Sikh regiment because Sikhs are the warriors. How can we not be in military? We take pride to be in, in wars, right? So to serve for our country, to help our people. So, but there has been in the recent years, about 10, 15 years, a lot of movement and being able to allow this still a hand. There has been no hard and fast rule passed to allow six. It's case by case basis. I would say there's about like six, seven of them that has been accepted recently at a good position in, in their attire. That doesn't mean six don't are not in the military, but being able to serve with a turban, with a beard, or for women to serve in a turban in the military or in the Air Force or in the Navy has been very few cases. But in Canada, there's a lot. In, uh, I mean, there's actually the defense minister is a Sikh, right? Canadian defense minister is a Sikh. Uh, can half of, I would say, Canadian parliament are Sikhs because they, they know about the work we do. Uh, singers, I, I've talked about um, Grammy Award winner, uh, police officers, basketball players, uh, famous basketball player, wrestlers, a uh, lot, lot of six in a lot of different areas. Next one, please. So these are talking about more everyday six so politicians, uh, president of India or prime minister of India about five years ago, six years ago. Yeah. Eight years ago was a sick. Uh, like I said, in Canada, a lot of politicians are sick. Now the right hand person helping Justin Trudeau in Canada is a sick. Uh, defense minister, like I said, is a sick. Lawyers, farmers, a lot of farmers in California. Most most of the farms run are run by sick families in California. Uh, filmmakers, doctors. Oh, you see a lot of sick doctors, right? Every hospital you go, everybody thinks my husband is a doctor because you see so many sick doctors. That's how you see them as, because education is important. Pilots, next one, please. So presentation wise, this is a presentation. Uh, we, we do have turban tying uh, for after we are done. And if you want to stay over and do turban tying, she's going to sing in a little bit. I wanted to do question answers before I have her sing so that if anybody needs to leave, then we can do that. Questions? Yes. She, she wants to add something. Sorry, um, I just wanted to add something that uh, my mom might have forgotten to mention. So um, while we are definitely a, okay, while we are definitely a religion that focuses on fighting for others and protecting others, um, and we use the word soldier a lot, we are a saint soldier soldier religion, which means that while we want to protect others, we don't want to always like. Um, participate in violence and such. There are so many different ways to protect and fight for others. And it's a big part to understand that we are both peaceful and we want to fight to help others. And so we're not a violent religion at all. Um, yeah, I think that's a really important thing. Um, so, so mostly understanding that that's a last resort. It's not like, okay, you said this to us or you did this to somebody, here we are to fight. No, that's a last resort. Always try to resolve things peacefully as much as you can. And that's why we talk about the gurus. First five gurus, we consider them saints. And then the next ones became saint soldiers because they started having armies and forces and they started learning how to work in the battlefield. Um, we talked about this a little bit last time. Uh, 1984 is an important date in Sikhism. Um, it was the it was a uh, Sikh genocide in India. Uh, like I said, you know, bounty hunters had prices on Sikh heads, but that has been going on. It it happened in in early 1700s. It happened. It kept happening. It happened in 1600s, and then in 1984. That's a big one for us because that we have seen in our lifetime. I was five years old. Uh, now you know my age. Uh, I was five years old, and I know that. Um, it was brutal to go through sex genocide. Um, there, I don't know how much you want me to just mention. Yeah, so Sikh, it was Hindu Sikh riots. So, and it was politically driven. It wasn't like Hindus against Sikhs. It was politically driven. So they had, you know, let the government of India did it. They attacked our holiest place, which is Amritsar, Harmandar Sahib, a lot of you know it as Golden Temple. It's a beautiful architectural monument. Um, 
it's all gold uh, plated and it is in a big pond of water. Uh, if you want to ever search Golden Temple, it will come up. That's the only place known as Golden Temple. But we call it Harmandar Sahib because it's really a temple for God and not for gold. So that's why the distinction. But un important to understand that was attacked, Akal Takht and uh, Harmandar Sahib was attacked in 1984 by the Indian army and uh, was destroyed when it was filled with people because we were celebrating birthday of our fifth guru, which is a very important date. And that time it was attacked. And uh, since then, there has been a lot of migration of Sikhs to US and Canada and, and, uh, and London, mostly because uh, we felt like we were not safe in our own country. So that's an important date to know 1984. So questions, anybody? Yes, please. So that's what we were explaining uh, just a minute ago, that we believe in being a saint, right? So that's peaceful part. But we also believe in being a soldier when it comes to fighting for the rights of others as a last resort. We don't go ahead and fight at the very beginning. And that's, that's another reason why we carry that little sword is because we are still soldiers. We take pride in being soldiers because soldiers don't always fight for money or land or something like that. A lot of times we're fighting for the rights of others, for justice, right? Doesn't America go and fight for justice for others? That's, that's how you have to look at it as American values, our Sikh values, is fighting for others for justice and not so much for land. Actually, there has been no Sikh battles for land ever. Sikh battles has always been for justice, even though Six are the only people in the world who have captured Afghanistan. Afghanistan has never been captured, have never been under any other rule other than Punjab regiment, other than Punjab in India. And that was mostly for social justice. I shouldn't say mostly, it was all for social justice. It wasn't to capture the land. It was for social justice. And that time, you know, the map was more fluid too. It wasn't that many borders as they are now. Does that answer your question? Anybody else questions, please? Sorry. Yeah, so like I said, sick, the word sick means learner. So all the gurus are sick because all of them are learners. And for me, you are all six because you're all learning today, right? We're all on our spiritual journey. So we are all learners. So definitely, definitely there. Uh, guru Nanak, the first guru, born into a Hindu family. And a lot of the gurus are born into Hindu family. So I'm not saying that we did not come out of, everybody came out of another religion, that's common. But our values have been Sikh values from Guru Nanak. And we also believe that the soul of Guru Nanak kind of transported to the soul of the next teacher. Um, so, so definitely all gurus are Sikh. Does that answer your question? Swami, I don't know about him. Yeah, not, not related to Sikh faith, um, related to more probably Hindu faith. Um, so do you have such a thing as sin? Like if somebody did an attack on gambling, would you judge them or they'd have to leave the religion or anything like that? Yeah, nobody is uh, exiled from the religion. Nobody is said to... You gotta leave, no. We don't have that. Everybody's welcome, so it's very important. Um, and there has been cases, at least in my lifetime, I've seen people who have done bad things. Um, let's say, you know, they have, uh, I don't wanna use like bigger examples, but like smaller things. Oh, thank you. Smaller things like somebody, I, I trip over my shoes all the time. Thank you so much. <laughs> See? Importance of women. <laughs> so, but you know, if they have, for example, done something wrong to a, a woman or, you know, again, gambled or smoked cigarettes or whatever, uh, when they come to temple, we don't really judge them because we think now they're on the journey, right? Now they're on the journey to get help, to learn, to hopefully not do those things again. So a, a very basic example, we, we were taking food to the homeless shelter and that shelter is very famous for having drug addicts there. Uh, 
And a lot of, so some people, I shouldn't say a lot of people, few people objected. They're like, you take food to that homeless shelter and that homeless shelter has so many drug addicts. It's filled with them. Should we really do it when drugs are banned in our religion? And I said, why don't we pray and say, may God help them? And they leave that bad journey and come into a better journey by eating the food that we prepared with love for them, right? So definitely we have to understand that, again, everybody's on their journey and we don't judge, okay, oh, this guy didn't keep their hair or this female didn't keep her hair. They cut their hair or they don't wear a turban or they do bad things or they have liquor stores. A lot of Sikhs have liquor stores, by the way. They have liquor stores because it's not allowed in our religion. We say, it's their journey. My sister is married to a Hindu. It's her journey. My mom was upset with her for years and years and years. And my no now my mom loves my brother-in-law, by the way. She's, she's like, totally, she's like, oh my God, he's my son. And they, they live close to each other in Canada. And they are, they are like, they are like one. My mom and my brother-in-law are probably closer than my sister and my mother. So, so it, it's the understanding that everybody's on their own journey. Right? So no judgment, definitely. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Yes, in the temple, men and women sit on separate sides. And the reason for that is to mostly to protect women too. And having that understanding that, you know, when you enter the temple, every temple is different. Some, some, in some places, men sit on the right and women sit on the left. In some, women sit on the other side. There's no hard and fast rule if it's right or left, because we don't believe in superstitions. We, we, we are all there to pray and go on our own spiritual journey. So we don't believe in superstitions at all. Definitely, that's one thing. It's like, we were very practical, but yes, men and women sit separately. Um, again, you have to think about it in, in different terms. You don't want somebody who has bad thoughts in their mind to do something wrong too. So that's also for protection. And also women might not feel comfortable sitting in midst of men when there are so many people sitting together. Because you know we are thinking here where we, right now we have six feet we had taped our temple floors six, six feet apart, but normally we're all sitting pretty close together and on larger festivals and things, people are sitting very close together and maybe women are not going to be comfortable sitting next to a man or maybe a guy is not comfortable sitting next to a woman that close. So that's the reason for separation. Any other reason for separation maybe? No? I mean, they can sit together. Let's say husband and wife wanted to sit together. They can, and nobody's going to object to it. So usually in Langar, even women sit separately from men, but usually they all put together. I always sit with them. Yeah. And nobody comes and says, oh, get up. You have to sit up. No, there's no women's side and men's side. It's more based on that. Any other questions? So obviously there were the caste system within Hinduism, right? So you had the Brahmins on top, and then you had the warrior in the middle, and then you had you had the the Shudra, which were the lowest of all. So yeah. So basically, in in uh, Sikhism, we got rid of the caste system, right? So you made all of them warriors. <laughs> they're all warriors. So basically, it's a war that you, you're fighting against within yourself sometimes, right? To be a better person. And then to have that courage to fight for someone else. That's the most important part. And that's what our gurus gave it to us. So our 10th guru, he was very young uh, when he took the guruship, right? He took the, he took the seat of being a guru. And he's the one who realized how important it is for six to be visible. He wanted to create such a human being who had the courage, who had the courage to fight for others. So if you ever get a chance, look at some of the um, sick wars fought, what my wife was talking about, it was always for justice. But imagine six make less than 2% of Indian population. So if you compare the statistics, some of the numbers, we are less than 2% in Indian population. But when it came to fighting for freedom in India, 40% of the sacrifices were made by Sikhs. 
figure that out. So it's, it's some of those numbers, it's just what's within us, right? The warrior culture, the warrior feeling is what you're bred into, what you were taught from the beginning. I hope that answered your question. I want to add one big thing because he said that and it made me think about it more. Is the war, is the war within us? We are fighting a battle within us too. And what is that battle? The battle with the five vices we talk, we call it. And it's called calm, krodh, lob, mohankar. I'm going to tell you in English. Lust, anger, ego, greed, and attachment. You know, deep attachment to money, to maybe a relative or maybe some, something, any attachment, doesn't matter, to my house or whatever, right? I'm deeply attached to my house. So, <laughs> but, but, you know, those five vices that live within us, we're also constantly fighting that battle. Right. So once you learn how to fight that battle, you become a better warrior. So that's the other other part of it. I think you had a question in the back. Uh, yes, Gurkha, absolutely. Gurkhas were great. And if you look at British history, and their so Sikh regiment was probably one of the finest. And to this day, anytime when India is stuck, the first regiment that goes for fighting is the Sikh regiment. They always send the Sikhs. We, we kind of like the Marines in India. Yeah. And, and not only that, if there is a drought, there is a war, there is a famine, there is natural or man-made disasters, six are the first one to approach. Ukraine war started, Khalsa aid from uh, England, they sent people there first to start helping in Ukraine. First ones to arrive before Red Cross, just, just saying. United Six are there now. We are, we run to these things. We're like, oh, there's something that people need help for, let's go. So I've been asking him, I want to go, I want to go. He said, first learn to walk properly. I damaged my foot a few years back. It's like, first learn to walk properly before you start fighting. But you know, the, this is kind of inbred in us. We want to go to help. We love to do it. So he's like, let's start collecting money to send it to the, the organizations that are helping that are actually doing work on grassroots. So we have been doing those things, but at the same time, it is very, very important for us to not only fight, but also send food. When COVID hit in India, and we talked about it last time, Sikh temples in India and here too, because we did it in, in our uh, temple in Albany too, became the place for uh, where we would do uh, uh, vaccination, became vaccination sites, testing sites, became hospitals. In India, there were people, because the waves came really bad in India, they didn't have the infrastructure and the hospitals to take care of, you know, if some, we are almost the largest population now, we're getting very close to China's population in India. So, so many people were sick during COVID and so many people were losing lives. So Indian uh, Sikh temples in India became hospitals. They changed their langar halls, the food halls into hospitals, set up beds, set up machines, brought oxygen concentrators. We sent, I think seven oxygen concentrators only from Albany. So each oxygen concentrator can save many, 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 many lives, right? So, and each one costed like, I think $800, $900 to send. So that's that's how it is. So and then they were sending packaged foods throughout India and and around Pakistan, Sri Lanka. They're going from India. That helicopter at Golden Temple at the Harmandir Sahib, which is I would say was one of the pious, most pious places for us to send food to all these areas of natural disasters or man-made disasters to help. They're sending food from there because even Indian government is like, we can send stuff, meds and foods. So Golden Temple is sending meds and foods. That's how dependent the culture is on the Sikh regiment. She, she thought quickly saying and then we're done. We're going to just say thank you even before we hear your daughter. Thank you so much for this. Yeah. I, I think you are helping us understand to live a mindful existence 
with all of the wonderful things that you've shared. Um, we know that there are some people who have another meeting that they must leave for. So those of you who are part of that current events, you may leave or you may stay. We want to just say thank you again to Bonnie, Tamir, Alec, and we get to hear your music. So please feel free to stay, those of you who are able. Thank you. This is another instrument that she plays. We couldn't bring it quite large, so she brought this one. So um, before I begin, I just want to give um, a little bit of information. So typically in our temples, we have these like lower stages and that's where you will sing. So um, normally I sit crisscross and uh, just right in front of it, but right now that's not really doable and that's totally fine. Um, so in our gurdwaras, our temples, we take our shoes off. And so I'm about to sing a prayer written by the fifth guru, the fifth teacher. So I'm just going to take my shoes off while I sing. And the main line of this prayer, which I guess could be compared to like um, a chorus, uh, translates to the Lord and master destroys the pain of the poor. He preserves and protects the honor of his servants. So um, I know my mom mentioned that we're supposed to cover our heads um, hopefully all the time, but especially in our gurdwaras, our temples, we're supposed to cover it in, sometimes people wear bandanas, they wear scarves, so I brought my scarf, so I'm just also going to wear that as well, and uh, oftentimes in our temples, there's somebody who accompanies and plays uh, some sort of percussion instrument just to like keep the beat, so I don't have another person, but I do have technology. Dean, the 
ठाकुर दीन दर्द निवार ठाकुर साधु संग पर जो गोपाल साधु संग पर जो गोपाल आन संजम के छु न सूज जतन काट कल काल दीन दर्द निवार ठाकुर दीन दर्द निवार ठाकुर राख जन की राख जन की आप दीन दर्द निवार ठाकुर दीन दर्द निवार ठाकुर दीन दर्द ने सारे गम पम गम द पम पम गर सा दीन दर्द ने वार ठाकुर दीन दर्द ने सारे गम पम गम द पम पम गर सा दीन दर्द ने दीन दर्द ने दीन दर्द निवार ठाकुर Just a piece of cloth that you can. With just a big piece of cloth. Now you fold it in a certain way to get there. He's much faster at it rolling than I am. Yeah, but I can do it with my hand actually. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else help me? The one you got like smaller piece.
Different ways. Yeah, so as you saw in the picture, there were different ways. I think only one way to do this particular one. I do it this way, but I could even do it around my. There are different ways. Just like everybody has different hairstyles, everybody has a different way of tying a dress. And he has like all the possible color books out there. He loves color books. Of course. So he matches it to what he's wearing. As it should be. Yes. Do it every morning. It's tough to do it on others, but when you're so used to doing it, you'll try. You'll do a woman's one, the round yeah. one. Yeah. We don't know the men's one, which would be somewhat cool. Yeah. So, cool. Yeah. You have to get used to it. Five meters, meters, the men's yeah. skirt is five meters. It was, uh, it was pretty intense. It was, uh, I hard by the end of it. Yeah. Especially because they're covering their ear. Yeah, so you have to tie your hair. So his hair is tied in a bun on the top, a top knot. I have a uh, this knot, but you can do a top knot or whatever. Yeah, and, yeah, and then you know you tie the turban around to kind of cover the top knot. Do you want me to show you all? Lucy, if you see me tying this, forget that. <laughs> <laughs> We have a puppy, so I don't do it. <laughs> she, she tries to get everything in her mouth. Ooh, it's it's so thank you. Go ahead. No, it's okay. It's not, my, it's not a good job on my part. It's okay. Okay. I'll show her how women's one is done. I'll send it to you. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. Usually this piece of rock is not just not like regular cotton, it's very fine. So it's not as heavy, even though it's five meters. Oh, it doesn't feel like it's very heavy. Well, we tied it up to stay. Yeah. 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 So women's turban again is done in different ways. I mean, you don't want it to be in between. So um, it could be done in this way. This is the round one. Usually you'll have another small piece of cloth which you can bring with us. So it's it's tighter that way. And for men too, they have another piece of cloth underneath to keep the hair tight. And then it goes on top. We just made a scarf to our temple. We we haven't. On our journey, we're not there yet. Yes. Yes. We are more conscious of what people think 
<laughs> so you're not there on a journey. Once you're on a journey where you don't care what people think, you will you embrace it more. So we wear our more like a scarf. But a lot of us, when we go to the temple, we have our head covered underneath the loose scarf because the scarf keeps falling. So we have like a little bandana underneath maybe so that it stays put so we don't have you know, bare head when praying. Because hair is very important in Sakiga. Hair, hair is not dead. People think hair is dead, so it's fine. Hair is not dead, hair is life. And hair endings have proteins in them and hair connects you to spirituality. So a lot of the religions in the past, actually most religions in the past didn't cut their hair. It became later on people started cutting their hair. So uh, Jesus didn't cut his hair. We've seen pictures of Jesus, he didn't cut his hair. We didn't, people didn't cut their hair because they always felt like hair is a connection with spirituality. So very important for hair connections uh, to connect to God or almighty power. What do you think of God? <laughs> Secret. He still has hair. Secret. <laughs> Somebody has barely any hair. <laughs> it's it, it's you know, that's <laughs> natural. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Even yeah, the Amaka and Judas are same connection, right? This part of the hair is head is the main spiritual connection. In a lot of religion, it's been understood that this part of the head is the main spiritual connection. So where you connect to God. So yamaka, right here. Yeah. Because that's the part of your head that connects. So it's, it's um, you have different chakras in your body, as Hindus say. Uh, I don't know how to translate that in English, but it's different parts that have doors to different things. So uh, heart has a door, throat has a door, and hands have a door. So there's a door uh, to spirituality is, is right here. So that's why yamaka is also over here. Um, the top knot is done here. So because of that connection. Thank you. Thank you.